Well, we made it. This is uh, the last sermon in the church series. And uh, for some, I know that that comes with much rejoicing and little parties going on, not just for Super Bowl, but for the end of the church series. For others, uh, they're disappointed that we didn't go a little bit deeper for a few people. Um, but for the majority, I hope, I hope that we all really uh, just, just sank in deeply into what God's Word said. And I hope we were enriched by it. I hope we were encouraged by it. I hope it gave us a, a better understanding and perspective on how God has designed His church. And, uh, and as we went through this, we looked at a, ver- a variety of different things. We looked at the nature of the church. Uh, we looked at metaphors for the church. We saw the church was a family and a body and a temple. We traced the church through the book of Acts. We looked at the mission of the church, that we are to glorify God. We are to make disciples. We are to edify the believers. We examined the leadership of the church. And then as we came to our final section, we looked at the authority of the church. And it's fascinating to me as you study the New Testament and as you look for this word church that you find that Jesus only mentions the word church twice. He mentions it in Matthew 16. He mentions it in Matthew 18. And it's fascinating to me that in both of those places where Jesus mentions the ecclesia, the church, the assembly, that both of them have to do with the authority that he gives them. In Matthew 16, as we saw that Jesus gives the keys of the kingdom to his disciples and that they are to use them to bind and loose on earth and and what they bind and loose on earth will be bound and loosed in heaven. And we don't fully understand what all that means until we get to Matthew 18, 15 through 20, which is what our passage, primary passage will be this morning. And, and as we get to that passage in that text, we begin to realize and see that what he is talking about there is, is really that the church has a responsibility to be able to declare what is a right gospel confession And who is a right gospel confessor? God has given them this local church, the authority that together as a body, they are to, to, through baptism, they are to identify people that this is a follower of Jesus who rightly believes the gospel. Through communion, they are to rightly identify these are followers of Jesus who understand the gospel. And as we'll see today through church discipline, they are to remove those who no longer affirm the hope of the gospel, whose lives no longer are a witness to a follower of Jesus Christ. Now the word that we use to describe this responsibility that the church has, the authority that the church has, is the word church discipline or the phrase church discipline. Or sometimes it's referred to as excommunication. But it's, it, I think it's really unfortunate that these words bear such negative connotation to so many people. They bear negative connotation the moment we hear them. We think of them in a very negative way. We think them in a, in a very punitive way. And, and, and they come with all kinds of imagery and all kinds of baggage. And so I wish we could rename this. I wish we could give it a, a different name. In fact, I, I wish we could call it discipleship or intensive discipleship. I wish we could call it loving accountability because those phrases better reflect what we're going to talk about this morning. That this sacred responsibility that the church has, that the essence of it is is a, is a deep, loving accountability. It is an intensive discipleship to help one another walk faithfully with Jesus Christ. Because the reality is love and obedience are at the heart of everything that we're going to talk about today. The central motivation behind all correction is love and obedience to the Lord. Now, when I say love is at the heart of church discipline, uh, there are some people that, that might raise their hand and be like, oh, excuse me, <laughs> that doesn't sound, that, that sounds like an oxymoron. When I think of church discipline, I don't think of love. And and that's a problem. Because biblically, love is at the heart of all correction. I mean, isn't that true of, of, of all discipline, of all correction? In reality, if it's done rightly, that at the heart of it is is love? 
I mean, if you're a parent here, hopefully you understand that in a very significant way. That You realize that all correction that takes place in your home, all discipline that takes place in your home should be because of love. Because you care for your children. Because you want to see them protected. Because you want to see them grow up into maturity. Because you deeply care about decisions that they're making and you want to guide them and shepherd them. And, and that's the heart of all discipline. The same is true of all biblical discipline. All discipline by the Lord and all discipline that he gives for his church. Listen to Hebrews 12, 5 through 8. The author of Hebrews echoes the exact same idea. He says, my son... Do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves, and he chastises every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you have to endure, for God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children, and you are not sons. Now, this is not a a, a popular theme, a popular idea. This is is not things that that grow evangelical churches in modern evangelicalism, evangelicalism, but this is biblical Christianity. This is the Lord Jesus Christ saying, listen, The Lord disciplines those whom he loves. If if you are not corrected by the Lord for for sin in our lives, if if God does not shape us and guide us and mature us and sanctify us, he says, you're illegitimate children. You're not truly sons. The correction that we receive is because of God's love. And the correction that God gives, the responsibility he gives to the church, The motivation of that should be love. And that's what we want to look at first. The motivation of correction. The motivation of correction. And the first motivation that we see is love. We should be motivated by love. Love says that I care about your eternal soul more than I care about my own personal discomfort. Because let's, let's be honest, anytime we correct, anytime we rebuke or reprove, anytime we have to address sin in someone's life, it is vastly uncomfortable. It is very difficult, very challenging. It it can fracture relationships. It can cause divisions and schisms. The motivation has to be love or we'll never get through it. We have to love people enough that we're concerned about their souls, that we're willing to to go through personal discomfort because we care deeply about them. That's what Paul says. That's a point he's making in 1 Corinthians 5, verse 5. Now, we've looked at that passage a number of times, and you remember what Paul's addressing there is gross sin that is taking place in this man's life. And he's calling the church that they are to publicly discipline this man. They are to publicly remove him from the church for the protection of the church and for the protection of the witness of Jesus Christ and ultimately for the protection of this man himself. Look at what he says in verse 5. He says, You are to deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of the flesh so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. What in the world is Paul saying? Paul is saying you are to remove this man from the covering and protection of the church You are to put him out into the world, the domain of Satan, where his sinful behavior, his sinful actions, where he will bear the fruit of that. And the reality of that is in hopes that through the destruction that will happen through this sin in his life, he will eventually come back to repentance and faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm more concerned about his soul than I am about his comfort. That's what Paul is saying to us. Because I love this man. Now the world might not understand this love. 
There are times that even Christians don't understand that this is a picture of love. But the Lord Jesus Christ is telling us that this is love. That this is the most loving thing that we can do because we care about a person's soul. And many times people say, well, I don't want to engage in correction because, because I care for that person too much or I love that person too much. The reality is that is, that is very rarely the case. The, the, most often the problem is not because we love people so much, it's because we love ourselves so much. It's because it's very uncomfortable for us to enter into conversations of correction. If we actually loved those people, we would, we would walk through the process that we're going to look at that Jesus gives us, but, but it's uncomfortable, it's difficult, it's challenging, and so it's because we really love our comfort. We say it's because I don't want to, you know, that's their private life. I don't want to get involved in their private life. The reality is there's no private life as a Christian. We have no private life. If somebody told you that, you are sadly mistaken. We are a body, and what we do affects one another, and we are going to stand before the Lord, and we are going to give an account for one another. We are, we are, we are, our responsibility is not just for our own discipleship, it's for the discipleship of one another, to help one another grow in Christ. If, if you've caught anything from this series, I hope it's that. I hope you realize and understand that we have a responsibility for one another, that we don't just live individual lives, we live collective lives as a community of faith, as a family of God, as a body of Christ. And if we truly love, then the Lord says we will lovingly correct. You know, when my children were little and, and I saw them going into a dangerous situation, maybe they were reaching up to grab a, a, a pot of boiling water or something, right? I didn't, I didn't just stop and go, well, they got to learn a lesson. It's their private life. They got to deal with that. No, no, I stepped in. I maybe even smacked their hand or grabbed them and, and kind of frightened them for a minute. But I did that because I love them, because I want to protect them, because I know the danger that awaits them if they grab that. And the reality is that if we love people, we will go after them, pursue them, even when it's uncomfortable for them and for us, because we truly love them. The danger causes us to act. The love drives us, motivates us to being willing to have the hard conversations. But not only is it love for our brother or sister, that's a great motivation, but even a greater motivation is that it's obedience to the Lord. The second motivation is that we should be motivated by obedience. We should be motivated by obedience. You see, the reality is the church belongs to the Lord Jesus Christ. It's his church. He's Lord of the church. He has bought the church by his blood. He instructs the church, leads the church, guides the church. And how can we simply ignore the Lord's clear commands in his word? How can we think that somehow these are optional things that we can choose to obey or disobey? How can we say, well, it's not really culturally relevant anymore to the Lord Jesus Christ? How can we think that we know better how to love God's people than God himself? How can we say, well, that's not really a loving thing to do when the Lord Jesus Christ says it's the most loving thing you can do? Do we really think we know more than the Lord, better than the Lord, that we can somehow lead his church better than he leads his church? The Lord has commanded us to follow his instructions for his good, for the good of his church, for our good. And if a church is going to call itself biblical, if it's going to call itself faithful to the Lord Jesus Christ, then it better be obedient to the Lord's commands. And this is one of those commands. So then what does the Lord say? What is his instruction in regards to addressing sin in the lives of one another? Well, he is absolutely crystal clear. Turn to Matthew 18. Matthew 18, verse 15 through 20. We find clear, direct instructions by the Lord on dealing with sin. And, and, and this is a passage that we should often remind ourselves of 
how the Lord has given us instruction. Matthew 18, 15 through 20. I'm, I'm beginning in verse 15. He says this. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you, that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, then let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. For truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And again I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among them. Let's pray. Oh, Father, we ask, God, that as we come to your word, Lord, that you would teach us. I pray that, that everything I say this morning, God, would be from your word, would be clear. I pray that, that you would uh, put it into our hearts, God. I pray anything that I say that's not helpful, Lord, that that would be erased. But, God, that you would help us know what have you called us to be as a church, that we would love one another to step into the mess to step into the difficult circumstances. God, that you might be honored, you might be glorified, and that people might come back to you in repentance. And so, Lord, teach us now from your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, as we look at Matthew 18, 15 through 17, we really see that there are four steps to this process. Now, you'll notice that there's no timeline given to this. There, there's wisdom that must be used in all of this. But, but there are very clear steps to this process. And I want you to look at the first step. And the first step is this. Go directly to the person. Let me say that again. Go directly to the person. Matthew 18, 15. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. The first step is to go directly to the person and to communicate directly the offense that has been done and to do it, to do it just between the two of you. How much harm and destruction could be avoided in the lives of people and in the lives of the church body if people just followed this clear command. But too often, when we're sinned against, we ignore this. We either hold it inside as a grudge against a person that they never know, that we avoid them, that we rebuke them, I mean, that we, that, you know, that we, we just avoid them or that we, we, we make things awkward or whatever it is, or even worse, we go and we talk to somebody else. We talk to another person about someone else's sin. Listen, if somebody starts talking to you about another person's sin and you are not directly involved in this process, you tell them to be quiet. I'm serious. You say, I don't want to hear that. You go and talk directly to them. And when you've done that, if they have not responded and you want me to be the witness then come back and we'll pray about that and we'll talk about that. But you go directly to them. I mean, how many times, how much could be avoided if we just did this one simple fact? But we don't. You know, I, I can't even count the amount of times that somebody comes to me and they talk to me and they say, man, you so-and-so is so upset with you. So-and-so has this problem or so-and-so. If you knew, What? What are you talking about? But to come directly to the person is how the Lord has designed his church. And I just want to tell you, if, if I've sinned against you, if I've offended you, would you please come and let me know that directly? I, I assure you, I will do my best to receive that in humility. If I don't, you have other elders to go to to advocate on your behalf that will help you that, that can walk with you in that. But I, I promise you, don't, 
if I've offended you, come directly to me. And I would say that that's, that's the same for every elder. Come to us directly and talk to us. We're just people, followers of Jesus. And if I've sinned, I want to know that so I can repent of that and be corrected on that. Don't go talk to somebody else. Do me the honor, have the respect to come and talk directly to me or to anyone else. If somebody has offended you, go directly to them, talk directly to them, privately, Jesus says. Right? And notice, this is not a suggestion. This is a command by the Lord. And we are called to obey. And Jesus illustrates how significant this command is in chapter 5 of Matthew. If you, if you flip back there, Matthew 5 He says this to him. He says in verse 23 through 24, he says, So if you are offering your gift at the altar and there you remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. God cares about our relationships in the body. God cares about our reconciliation to one another. And he gives us clear, concise direction. And we need to obey. And now the second thing he says in this step is, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. As we go, we are to explain in biblical terms how we feel that we were sinned against using biblical framework for the sin that has occurred. And and talking to that person and asking them, do they recognize it? Do they see it? And are they, are they, will they repent of it? And we are to go not with an attitude of judgment, but with an attitude of forgiveness. Our heart should be to go and, and to be ready to receive and welcome repentance and to be ready to give forgiveness. That's the heart of what. Jesus is saying here, it should be done in love and it should be done in privacy and in confidentiality. Notice what he says there, between you and him alone. In every step of this process, the people involved should be as narrow as the offense. The people involved should be as narrow as the the offense. If there's, if if in the first step, it's one-on-one. It's one person to another person. If, if there's a response of unrepentance, then there's another per- then there are other people who get involved. But the other people that get involved are just as narrow. Notice that there's a very narrow scope and it only grows as unrepentance is demonstrated. And the reason it grows is because the severity of the reality of the situation needs to set in more and more. And there needs to be more and more godly witnesses to say, look, what you're doing is sin and you need to repent. I'm concerned about your eternal soul if you continue in this because Christians repent. It's the mark of a follower of Jesus that we repent. And if somebody is not willing to repent of sin, something is broken, something is wrong. Notice what he says there. He says, if he listens to you, you have gained your brother. Friends, this is the hope. The hope is repentance, forgiveness, restoration, reconciliation. This is the point of everything, right? It's not punitive. It's not, I want to harm you. It's, I want to forgive you. And I want you restored. He says, if he listens to you. Now, this signifies a response of repentance. He's not just saying, if he hears you. He's saying, if he listens to you. If he actually listens to what you say and responds appropriately appropriately to what you say, then you have gained your brother. Now, what's interesting about this word gained in the Greek is that you can translate it one, like W-O-N. And it's used in other places in the scripture to refer to the actual obtaining of final salvation. That the, that, that, the, the final salvation has been obtained and won. The victory has been won. It's the same word, the same concept. Jesus is saying here, your, your brother is, is in Christ. Your brother is, is, is saved. 
That's what he's saying. Now we know that salvation comes only at one time. It's through justification and faith. It's, it's through faith in Jesus Christ. We know that. But there is a constant idea in the scripture that final salvation is obtained in the end. That, that, that the victory is actually won in the very end. That, that salvation is shown as we persevere to the very end. And, and here we see that this is one of those marks of perseverance. Repentance. Your brother is gained. You have gained your brother. Now this is a beautiful picture of true Christian love. I love you enough that I'm willing to go to you directly. I'm willing to rebuke you privately. I'm concerned about your heart and soul and I want you to be cl- I want you to to come and re- repent. I want you to be closer to Jesus. I'm concerned about your soul. This is a picture of true Christian love. And the hope is restoration and forgiveness. And friends, this is, this is the heart of, if you want to call it church discipline, this is the heart of it. This is where hopefully 99% of everything that's called church discipline happens right here. That we go individually, one-on-one, privately, rebuke one another in love. Rebuke sounds like a strong word, but just confront one another in sin and, and hope to see repentance and forgiveness. And, and it happens all the time. And it should happen all the time. It should be what takes place because guess what? We're sinners. And there's going to be a time where, where I might sin against you. Maybe it's un, unknowingly. Maybe it's I'm having a really bad day and I sin against you. And you come to me and you rebuke me in that sin. And the Holy Spirit works on my heart. And I repent. And I ask you to forgive me. And our relationship is restored. And we grow closer to Christ. And we're sanctified together. And that's the process. Somebody in your community group sins against you. Somebody, you have kids and somehow through that kid relationship, there's something that happens. Don't just store that all inside. Don't just hold that. Don't just tell other people. Go directly, privately, and both of you grow in Christ. That's the hope. But unfortunately, sometimes it doesn't stop there. Sometimes somebody is is so hardened in their heart that they are stuck in their sin that they will refuse to repent and they will continue to sin against you. Well, what does Jesus say next? Well, then he says, bring along a witness. Look at verse 16 with me. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. So here is when another person is brought in. Maybe two, maybe three. Notice that the circle is still small, but more members of the church are being brought in to intensify the seriousness of the situation to the individual, to help them understand that what is going on is significant. It matters. And how they respond matters. They are to be a witness, the text says. Now, the witness here, which goes back into the Old Testament, which I don't have time to go back into all the Old Testament, but the idea there is that they are a witness to the person's response. They don't necessarily have to be a witness to the person's sin. They are a witness to the person's response to that sin. They are hopefully impartial. They are a mature believer in Jesus Christ who has relationship with all people involved and that they can and that they want to see re- reconciliation. They want to see Christ honored. They are a mature follower of Jesus that you bring into the conversation, that you bring into the situation. And they may get involved and they may say to the person that is is thinking that they've been sinned against that what happened to them really wasn't sin. That they're, they're overreacting. That the offense that they think happened to them is not biblically sin. Maybe they just, it, it was a bad situation, but it wasn't sin. They, they're mature enough to see that. Maybe they correct the tone or the style of the rebuke and they say, look, it does not seem like you're really going to your brother in love. You're you're bringing accusations that are harsh and unkind. And sometimes the, 
the witness will affirm the offense and see that the offender is really minimizing their sin, not really understanding the situation, not, not recognizing that what they're doing is actually sin against God and sin against another. You see, it's the impartial witness, the mature follower of Jesus, that is brought into the situation to help bring clarity to two people that are just clouded by their circumstances and situation. And as they're brought in, hopefully they can bring some clarity, and hopefully the Lord can work through these witnesses. Now, it's, it's somewhere between this step and the next step that the elders of the church would be brought in. They often serve as another witness. And if the whole church is going to be the final step, then it really, the elders are the ones that are going to lead the church in that process. They're the ones that are going to kind of be a barometer to decide, does the whole church need to be involved in this situation? And so somewhere in between these two steps, we, we would see the elders coming in as another witness, as a significant witness. And, and there may be four, five, six, seven, eight witnesses brought into a situation. It just depends what the situation is the, to, to bring some intensity by the members to this individual into this situation. Now, if there's still a hard heart, if there's still an attitude of unrepentance, then the third step is to bring the full pressure of the church body upon this person. And this is where it gets really awkward in our culture. And this is where churches begin to bow out left and right. Look at verse 17. If he refuses to listen to them, then tell it to the church. There is no question in Scripture as you study it, the final authority in the life of the body, in the life of the believer, is the local church that God has put them in. This responsibility is not for every Christian out there. It's not for Christians just anywhere. This is for specific responsibility inside of a local church, that we have specific responsibility towards one another. And this is part of what that responsibility is. Tell it to the assembly, the ecclesia that we've looked at, the, the church. And, and Jesus is so clear in verses 18 through 20. That's what he's emphasizing there, right? In verses 18 through 20, he says, truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. This authority rests within this local church. We see that not only here, but we also see it in 1 Corinthians 5, which we've which we've seen in verse, verses 4 through 5, Paul says to the church, when you are assembled in the name of the Lord Jesus, and my spirit is present with the power of our Lord Jesus, you are to deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of the flesh so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. Paul says when you're assembled, when you are the church together, you are to act judicially. Both Matthew 18 and 1 Corinthians 5 are, are given in context of a judicial process, of a judgment. You are to give a judgment as the body of Christ in this situation. And that's why it's so important that I've said over and over again in this series, that's why it's so important that a local church knows who its members are. Who has this responsibility? Because it's not just everybody that gathers on a Sunday morning because the reality is on, on, a, on a morning like this, there are both believers and non-believers. There are both people that are the church and that are not the church. And so how a church does this, the, the responsibility that they have is vital and important. For us, I'll just tell you what we would do. For us, this would be done in the context of a of a family membership night. When all the people that are gathered there are members of our body, they've all made a covenant to one another. They, they've all expressed commitment to Christ and commitment to one another. And in that process, we would through prayer, we would through tears, we would identify everything that had taken place up to that, that part of the process, and we would call the whole church family to pray. And we would call anybody that knows that person to go and to directly 
speak to them and, and, and confront them in their sin and call them to repentance. And we would do that for a period of time. And then as a church family, there would be the final step. And there's, there's no time frame given for this. This requires incredible wisdom. This process requires incredible grace and incredible patience. But it also can't go on forever. There has to be clarity. There has to be a sense of urgency. And this really is, it's the last resort. It's the final resort uh, in, in a in a a situation where a person has consistently demonstrated a hardness of heart to everybody that has approached them, everybody that has confronted them, everybody that has called them to repentance, they have only demonstrated a hardness of heart. And after a multitude of witnesses, and after the, the whole entire church body affirms this hardness, well, then the final option is to sadly remove this person from the church. It's the only option to be obedient to the Lord Jesus Christ. Is to remove the person from the church. And that's the last step. Removal from the church. Look at what Jesus continues to say there. He says, if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Now, Gentile and tax collector, that might not make a lot of sense to us, but it sure made a lot of sense to these Jewish people. They understood exactly what Jesus was saying. A Gentile, a tax collector, they were cut off from the community, the covenant community of faith. They were not a part of God's people. They were visibly not a part of God's people. And Jesus is saying that if they refuse to listen Even to the church, you are to cut them off. You are to publicly remove them from the assembly, from the gathering, from the body, from the membership of the body. You are to say, we can no longer affirm this person's salvation or faith in Jesus Christ. What Jesus is saying is is an unbaptism of sorts. It's a public demonstration that this person is no longer, in our minds, no longer a part of the covenant community. They no longer evidence that they are part of the new covenant in Jesus Christ. Now, now obviously, only the Lord knows a person's heart. Only the Lord knows if somebody is saved. That is God's business and God's business alone. But the responsibility, the the sacred responsibility that he has given his church is outlined here. And all the church can do is respond to the person's fruit and the person's decisions and the person's responses. And if there is only a response of hardness, if there's only a response of rejection, then the church has only one response to be obedient. And of course, the world will not understand this. And there are many people that will say, well, this seems incredibly unloving. How could a church possibly do something like this? And yet, the Lord tells us in his word that this is actually the most loving thing that we can truly do. It is unloving to let this person continue in their sin. It is unloving to allow them to to think that they're saved when their lives evidence no have no evidence of salvation. It is the responsibility of the church to act. And so what does it mean to treat somebody as a gentile and a tax collector? Well, first of all, It does not mean that we are cruel or unkind to them. It does not mean that we ignore them, avoid them at all costs. If we see them at Costco, we try to run to the other aisle. That's not, not what it means. It means that we recognize with tears that there is no longer fellowship in the Lord. It means that we recognize that that there is no longer fellowship as believers and that there's no fellowship with Jesus Christ. We don't treat them as we treat a follower of Jesus. There's, There's no fellowship there. 
We pray for them. We, we, we share the gospel with them. We would treat them just like we would any other person who is who's not a follower of Jesus. We would love them. We would try to care for them as best we could. We would share the gospel with them, but we would not pretend. Not pretend like they're a follower of Jesus when there's no evidence that there's no fellowship in the Lord. It also means that 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 we would not recognize genuine fellowship in the Lord with them, meaning that specifically, as we talked about last week, the Lord's Supper, we would, we would not allow them to partake of the Lord's Supper, not allow them to participate in the Lord's Supper in our, in our assembly, because that would be, a, that would be a, a heretical. That would be a hypocritical. That would be somebody saying, I'm in fellowship with Jesus Christ, when the reality is the whole church has said, no, you're not. So one of the, the most sacred acts that we do we saw last week is this act of of communion where where we identify our participation with the lord our participation with one another paul says in first corinthians 10 16 he says the cup of blessing that we bless is it not participation in the blood of christ the bread that we break is it not a participation in the body of christ communion reflects fellowship with god it reflects fellowship with one another and in this situation there is None. And so we can no longer identify them as a member of the body of Christ. It means we pray for them, share the gospel with them, and we seek their repentance and reconciliation. And that's what brings us then to the final thing that we want to see this morning, and that is the goal of correction. The goal of correction. What are we aiming at? What's the whole point of this? The whole point of this is repentance and restoration. It's not to punish someone. It's not to harm someone. It's to see the Lord use what he uses by his spirit, by his word, and by his church, bring the intensity level to such a degree that somebody realizes that they are cut off from God's community, and that through that they would repent and come back to Jesus Christ. We are seeking to win our brother or sister back to the Lord. That's the essence of of all correction. In Galatians 6, chapter 1, Paul says this, Brothers, if anyone is caught in any sin or transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourselves, lest you too be tempted. Pastor uh, scholar Tom Schreiner says it this way. He says, The goal of discipline is not the humiliation or public rebuke of those straying. Rather, the design is to restore them to the fellowship of the redeemed community. The whole point is that they might come to forgiveness and not run off to another church, but to be restored back into this church, to be corrected, to repent, and to be restored. That's the hope. That's the prayer. That's the goal. And the beautiful picture of this is 2 Corinthians 5 through 11. Turn with me there real quick. It's, it'll be up on the screen there, I think, for you as well. But 2 Corinthians uh, 2, 5 through 11. Now, some people think that this is the man in 1 Corinthians 5, and, and I think there's a lot of justification for that. Others think, no, maybe this is somebody else. Whatever the case is, this is a person who has been removed from the church through church discipline. And Paul is now giving them instruction because it seems like this person has repented. Look at verse 5. It says, Now if anyone has caused pain, he has caused it not to me, but in some measure, not to put it too severely, to all of you. For such a one, this punishment by the majority is now enough. So you should rather turn to forgive and comfort him, or he may be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. So I beg you to reaffirm your love for him, For this is why I wrote you, that I might test you and know whether you are obedient in everything. For anyone whom you forgive, I also forgive. Indeed, what I have forgiven, if I have forgiven anything, has been for your sake in the presence of Christ, so that we should not be outwitted by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his designs. Now, what we notice here is that whatever this man did brought great sorrow upon the church. Public shame, public sin, and and the public process of discipline brought great sorrow to them. And that's the reality of 
Anytime we have to walk through correction and discipline, especially if it gets to the level of the church, it should only be with tears and with prayer. And, and many, many, many tears and prayer have already been shed through this. It brings great sorrow to the whole church. And in verse 6, we see it was the majority, meaning the whole church gathered and they made a decision to bring discipline upon this man. But, but evidently, Paul felt like this man had come to repentance, that he had demonstrated forgiveness or, or a change of heart, that he no longer had a hard heart. And so what Paul says to them is that don't allow this situation now to be an opportunity for Satan to destroy this person. You are to forgive. Notice what he says there. You are to turn to forgive and to comfort him. This means that the person should be fully restored back into fellowship. There's no probation period. There's no like, okay, let's see if this is real in your life. If there's significant evidence to demonstrate that there has been repentance, then there is a reason to welcome them back into fellowship. And it's instantaneous. It's to bring them back in. Now, if they engage in sin again, the whole process starts again, just like every other Christian. But it's not that they're, they have some kind of scarlet letter on them. They, they are entered back into fellowship. They are welcome. They are loved. They are welcomed back to the communion table. They are brought back into the body of Christ because they have, they have come home, right? It's the story of the prodigal son. They've returned. They've come home. And the father wraps his arms around them, loves them, and receives them back when there's a change of heart. This is the, the whole hope, the whole goal. Notice verse 8. I beg you to reaffirm your love for him. Receive him back. Let him know that he is a child. Receive him back into the covenant community. Receive him back into fellowship and into communion. This is the ultimate goal. It's not to punish. It's not to shame. It's to seek true repentance, true restoration. It's because we care about a person's soul. It's because sin destroys, it kills, it damages. And the Lord has given a sacred responsibility, first to us as Christians, and then to us as a whole church. A sacred responsibility that we would walk in loving correction it's not easy. It's not comfortable. It's not popular in our world today. It'll be critiqued. It'll be misunderstood. It'll be evaluated by all watching, saying like, oh, you should have done this, or you should have done that, or you shouldn't have done that, or you should have. It'll, it, we just have to recognize that, realize that, and trust the Lord. And know that the Lord is sovereign. And know that the Lord leads us and guides us by his word. And we need to be faithful and obey. You know, the reality is it, just be, it would just be easier to pretend like this isn't in the Bible. I think it was Jefferson that like kind of cut out parts of the Bible he didn't like and made his own Bible. I mean, that would just be easier, right? To say, I don't like this. I don't like this being in here. I don't, this is uncomfortable. I don't want to do this ever in my life. Let's just pretend it's not there. But the reality is it's, it's there. The reality is the Lord knows what's best for his church. The reality is this is the Lord's church. And we're called to be faithful and obedient. And because we love the Lord, because we love his people the way he's called us to, because we want to be obedient to his word, then the church really has no option but to obey. And so our hope is that in this, first of all, our hope is that we never, ever, have to walk through this. Our hope is that if we ever do, our, that Christ's name would be honored in the midst of it. That sin would be seen as serious in one another's lives. That as you go through correction, that everybody would take an account. That we would recognize our own sin and repent of that. And that repentance would be the posture that we all pursue. I just pray that the Lord would give us wisdom. That His Spirit would lead us that he would guide us through these delicate matters for his name, for his glory, and for the good of his people. Let's pray. Oh, Father, we, uh, we hear your word this morning, and we ask, God, that you would 
Just change our hearts, Lord. Father, that through your word and by your spirit, you would lovingly remind us, God, that that you know best, that you are sovereign, Lord, that you love your people, and that you have given us clear direction. Father, I pray that, that we would not be afraid to obey your word. I pray that we would be patient and gentle. I pray that we would be wise in all that we do. God, that you would lead us. And I pray, Father, that, that we would be a church that takes sin seriously in our own lives and in the lives of our body. I pray that we would be a holy people, a people that would be a light and a salt to a watching world, a community, that they would actually see a difference in the lives of the followers of Jesus Christ and lives that are different than those of the world. Father, we love you. We want to honor you. We want to obey you with everything that we have. And so, Lord, would you, would you help us by your spirit? We so desperately need your help. We will mess all of this up if we try to do this in the flesh. And so lead us and guide us by your spirit, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.